Episode 30, Rabbi Jesus. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi who gathered disciples and taught them how to interpret the Torah, the sacred scriptures of Moses. Learn how Jesus compared to other famous Jewish rabbis like Hillel and Shammai. In this episode, we'll look at Jesus' emphases and style in his teaching ministry. Anyone seeking to understand the historical Jesus cannot hope to genuinely grasp him apart from his role as rabbi. If you'd like to watch a video of this class or download the course notes, visit restitutio.org. Here is part six of the historical Jesus, Rabbi Jesus. The people of Jesus' time cared a great deal about the Bible. That's not to say they could all read, but it does mean that the Bible dominated their oral culture. Living at that time, God's people adhered to the Torah. This term can either refer to the instruction God gave Moses on how he wants his people to live in the land, or the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. How I'm going to be using it right now is in reference to the instruction God gave to Moses, what we also frequently call the law. Far from thinking of God's law as an impossible ideal they could never live up to, the Israelites regarded it as a superior way of life that God graciously gave to his people. And I want to make that point clear to you by looking at Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the longest psalm in the Bible. It's a Torah psalm. There are several of these psalms that extol the Torah or God's law. Psalm 119 has 176 verses. It's broken into 22 sections based on the Hebrew letters of the Aleph Bet with eight verses in each section that all start with the same letter. So the first eight verses all start with Aleph, and the second eight verses all start with Bet, and then Gimel, and so on, through the Hebrew letters. And I think the point here for Psalm 119 is the structure points to the orderliness of the Torah-centered life. And throughout the psalm, almost every verse uses a word for Torah, which is usually translated law in our Bible. So it'll say law or testimonies, ways, precepts, statutes, commandments, judgments, word, or ordinances. You go through this psalm and you'll see that almost every verse does that. And I, I've just cherry-picked a few verses out of this psalm to show you how ancient Hebrew people felt about the Torah. Verse 11 from, Hebrews, or from Psalm 119. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Verse 16, I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. In fact, memorization was a major part of their culture, much more than for ours. We have paper, paper was extremely expensive in their world, and they didn't even have smartphones. You couldn't even just voice record things. They didn't even have Bluetooth in their cars, in their camels, or anything, you know? So memorization was a big part of their way of thinking. So they would memorize scripture. Verse 47, for I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. That's a big statement. This person delights in the Torah, in the law of God. I will lift up my hands towards your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. Verse 72, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. I will never forget your precepts. Verse 93, for by them you have given me life. I am yours. Save me, for I have sought your precepts. Verse 97, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. This is somebody who is meditating on Leviticus, on the part of you know, Deuteronomy, the part of the Bible that talks about what God's commands are, the Torah. They meditate on it day and night, and they say, I love your law. Verse 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. 136, my eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. 
Verse 162, I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law. Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous rules. Verse 167, my soul keeps your testimonies. I love them exceedingly. So that gives you a perspective of a, a Jewish person, or at least a Hebrew person, on how they felt about the law of God. <clears throat> and transmitting God's laws from one generation to the next was extremely important. And they had gotten it down. They had scribes that would meticulously copy letter after letter after letter. If you look at the geography of Israel, this is just a, a modern map here, but it, you can you could probably see Israel around here somewhere. Let me uh, point to it here. Can you see my point? You probably can't even see my pointer. There, there it is right there. See it. So that's Israel right there. And so Israel is on the crossroads between Africa and Asia, as well as Europe. And to the, east of, to the west of Israel is a sea, okay? To the east is a desert. So if you wanted to do trade between somewhere in Europe and Africa, and you didn't have a boat, you had to go through Israel. Or if you wanted to go f and bring silk in from the east and bring it up or down to Egypt, you would trek through Israel. And so Israel was con uh, conquered and, and, and troops marched through there repeatedly in empire after empire. You know, it was the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and then it was the Persians, and then the Greeks, and the Romans, and it didn't even stop there. There was still empire after empire that came through that land. I think the last empire that went through there was Britain. But anyhow, it's a land that was very volatile, very susceptible to people wanting to conquer it. And so the people had to get really good at preserving the scriptures. It's not like they lived off on an island somewhere where you just make one copy every hundred years and you're going to be fine. You had to make lots of copies all the time and people needed to memorize it. And, and, and there needed to be people that would teach it to the next generation. And they embedded it in the holidays where they would celebrate God's acts of deliverance for his people. And then those holidays we see in Leviticus are embedded into the calendar in the rhythm of the year. So when there's harvest, there was a festival. And people would gather together and they would learn and hear about God's laws. They loved to memorize Scripture. They loved to study Scripture in the time of Jesus, and they loved to argue about Scripture. Have you ever heard the old adage, ask two Jews, get three opinions? I don't know how old that one is. But in the time of Jesus, there were Pharisees, there were Sadducees, there were Essenes, there were Zealots, and there were followers of Jesus, all of them having a different perspective on how to understand God's laws. And then you had the rabbis, the rabbis, their beards. And so the rabbis were the ones who taught a particular view of understanding the law of God. I want to show you by example. I've got two examples for you. One is summarize the law. This is from the Babylonian Talmud, the Sabbath tractate, folio 31.8. It says, on another occasion, it happened that a certain heathen came before Shammai and said to him, Shammai is a rabbi, Make me a proselyte on condition that you teach me the whole Torah while I stand on one foot. Thereupon he, Shammai, repulsed him with the builder's cubit, which was in his hand. Translation, he took a, sti a stick and he beat him with it. <laughs> Dumb question. When he went before Hillel, he said to him, it's a different rabbi, uh, Hillel said to him, What is hateful to you, do not to your neighbor. That is the whole Torah, while the rest is the commentary thereof. Go and learn it. And then another rabbi, in Matthew 7, 12, Jesus says, So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And so one rabbi, Rabbi Shammai, says, Dumb question, get out of here, and he beats the man with a stick. Another rabbi says, whatever is hateful to you, don't do to other people. And then Rabbi Jesus, who lives a little bit after the time of Hillel and Shammai, 
Rabbi Jesus says, do to others what you want them to do to you. So it's just a little slightly different take on it. But that's what rabbis did. They would try to summarize the law. Another example, what reason for divorce is righteous or, or correct? Bet Shammai, or the, this is uh, the house of Shammai. The, the, so the way a rabbi w- would work is a rabbi would gather around him disciples. And the disciples would be students that would learn his teaching. And then they would become rabbis and pass it on to the next generation. And then they would get their own disciples and so on. And that's how you get your teaching to last long enough that it actually gets written down. This, this document comes to us from hundreds of years after the time of Christ. Um, and the house of Shammai, or Bet Shammai, say, A man should not divorce his wife unless he has found her guilty of some unseemly conduct, as it says, because he hath found some unseemly thing in her. That's a quote from Deuteronomy. So they're, they're, he's saying, well, if you find some unseemly conduct, you can divorce her. That's what Shammai said. But Hillel, however, say that he may divorce her even if she has merely spoilt the food, since it says, because he hath found some unseemly thing in her. And then Rabbi Akiva comes from the century after Christ. Rabbi Akiva says he may divorce her even if he finds another woman more beautiful than she is. As it says, it cometh to pass if she find no favor in his eyes. So the scriptures allow for divorce in Deuteronomy. The question is, well, like, what are the restrictions on that? How does that exactly work? And then Jesus, the rabbi, says, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And so each one has their own take on how to interpret what the law teaches. In the time of Jesus, people did not go around saying, Rabbi Jesus, Rabbi Hillel, Rabbi Shammai. They, did, they just didn't use titles like that yet. That happened not too long after the time of Christ. They started doing that. But in the time of Jesus, they would call him Rabbi. They would say, Rabbi, what do you think we should do here? And they would call him, te- and, and people recognized Jesus as Rabbi, different kinds of people, not just his followers, right? Here's an example of uh, followers of John. The two disciples heard, this is John 137, him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, calls Jesus Rabbi. A blind man who didn't know Jesus at all went up to him and called him Rabbi. The crowd called him Rabbi. And, of course, his disciples called him rabbi. Jesus grew up going to synagogue, and and people would puzzle, where where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? That's Matthew 13. In John 7, it says, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? Notice what these two little snippets do tell us. They tell us two things. One, that people recognize that he had wisdom, right? Because they're saying, where did he get this wisdom? And then the second point there is that this man has learning, right? So they recognize he had wisdom, he had education, maybe is how we would put it today, he had learning, right? But the question was, where did he get it from? Isn't this the carpenter's son? He's not a follower of a famous rabbi. Where is he getting all this? And of course, Jesus claimed he was getting it from the source, not from a teacher of the Torah, but from the giver of the Torah himself, from God. And they were puzzled about Jesus. But Jesus was recognized as a rabbi. And every rabbi has their own set of teachings. And so Rabbi Jesus has his set of teachings. And I don't have time to go through all of his teachings. You know, he, he, there, it's just hundreds of verses and different topics that he talks about. But I want to just do kind of an overview of some of the different aspects of what flavor or um, spin this particular rabbi had on things so that you understand where Jesus is coming from. Because it, in some ways it's different than everybody else, and in some ways it's the same as everybody else of his time. The thing that's the same, I can already tell you right now, is that they're doing business with the text. They're wrestling with Scripture. They're, they're trying to understand, all right, this, this, these Scriptures were written over a thousand years ago. How does that relate to us now under Roman occupation in the modern world in which we live? That's what everybody's doing in Jesus' time, and he's no different. He's explaining how to live 
according to the wisdom that he had. And uh, we'll look more next time about Jesus' connection to the Father and um, that relationship. But the first point I want to make about the Rabbi Jesus and his teachings is that his teachings were simple yet profound. People recognized that they were profound. But Jesus, when he talked, he didn't use a lot of technical terminology. However, he would be able to converse with regular folks as well as educated, snobby religious leaders just as well. You know, so he, he would talk to everybody, but he, he didn't, he wasn't a, you know, what, what he said was simple yet profound. Um, he talked, as we saw last time, about living in light of the kingdom. You know, Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Jesus talked about the kingdom constantly in his teachings. I already mentioned that last time. His teachings were also, also very um, paradoxical many times. Look at this, Matthew 5.10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. What? If you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, that means you're doing the right thing and people are persecuting you. That's a bummer. That's not a blessing. Right? I mean, we, we're so used to hearing it. They're like, oh, yes, blessed are all those who are persecuted. No! That, was, that would have been shocking. That would have been apparent. What do you mean we're blessed? And then he gets to the end. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Ah, so in the end, you get a reward if you uh, do, do the right thing and are persecuted for it. Mark 10, 31. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. So that's paradoxical, right? Matthew 10, 39. Whoever finds his life will lose it. What? If you find your life, you lose it? And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So Jesus would speak in a paradoxical way sometimes. At other times, he would be countercultural. Not always, but sometimes Jesus would say something that directly goes against the common understanding of the day. In Matthew 5.33, Jesus says, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely. Translation, Everybody thinks this, this way about this. You've heard it was said to those of old, don't swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all. So Jesus is coming against the common way of thinking about oaths. Oh, well, don't make an oath unless you're going to keep it. That's the common wisdom. He's like, no, 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 no. Don't make oaths. Just don't do it. Matthew 5, 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. People used to say that in Jesus' day. Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So again, he's going against the culture in that, in that aspect. Jesus would spend time with sinners and he would eat with them and drink with them. And the Pharisees would ask him, why are you eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus would say, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Sounds just like a rabbi, right? Like He's like, those who are sick need a physician. That's why I spend time with these people who need me, right? It's beautiful. Another example is uh, disciples typically fasted. And so the Pharisees gave Jesus' disciples a hard time. They're like, well, the disciples of John fast. The disciples of the Pharisees fast. Why don't you fast? So they brought it to Jesus, and Jesus said, how are they going to fast so long as the groom is with them? You know, this is the time for rejoicing. We're, we're heading up to the wedding, and, you know, he's speaking metaphorically, but there will be a time when the groom is taken away, and then they will fast. And so Jesus isn't, I don't want you to get the impression that Jesus is some radical who's redefining everything and saying that nobody else knows anything about what they're talking about. He's not doing that. He's coming against certain things, and we're going to look at where he has conflict with people. But he is a rabbi doing what rabbis do, which is he teaches from the Bible and explains how to live it out in his own day. I'm convinced he's the best rabbi. He's the only rabbi, I mean, whatever. But, I mean, who, did you ever heard of Hillel before this, or Shammai, or Akiva, or, you know, the, Gamaliel is a famous rabbi from the time of Christ, you know, but name one of his teachings, right? I mean, like, it, but with Jesus, we have four books chock full of 
his teachings that we can read to this day in 554 translations on the planet. You know, I'm not trying to brag, but I think he's, he's the best rabbi. Uh, he was a master teacher. Um, before the age of TED Talks or impressive visuals, Jesus would use his environment. You know, they, they would, they, he would say, a mustard seed. Well, you know, mustard seeds were, you know, grew into these mustard bushes. They would, they would be around. He would point them out. He said, you know, the birds, um, God takes care of the birds, right? There were probably birds right there when he said that. Um, another example is um, one time his disciples are arguing about who's the greatest. And Jesus takes a child and sets the child in the midst and says, unless you become like a child, you can't be the greatest. Actually, he says, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. He took the child in his arms. Once he cursed a fig tree to teach them about faith. You know, he, would, he, he had visuals. He was a good teacher. He was a master teacher. People like that. He told parables. What are parables? They're short, memorable, fictional stories to make a point about a truth or a behavior. And so Jesus would tell different parables in, to different audiences. So to the crowds, Jesus would tell parables to hide the truth. And he would, um, you know, he would tell, like the parable of the sower and the seed. You know, a sower goes out to sow. He throws some seed on the path and the birds come and gobble it up. Some seeds he throws among the thorns. Other seeds he throws among the rocks, and they spring up, and the sun burns them out. And then some other seed falls in the good soil, and it produces a crop 30, 60, or 100-fold. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What? <laughs> they already know about farming. You know, what are they thinking? Man, that's a wasteful farmer. You know, like they're not getting it at all. And so he would, he would use the parables to conceal the truth so that only those with eyes to see and ears to hear who would actually come up to him and ask him would get the truth the parable was teaching. However, to his disciples, he would tell parables to just explain things. For example, the wise man built his house upon the rock. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. Right? The wise man... His house is going to stand when the storm comes, but the foolish man, his house is going to go splat when the storm comes, right? What's he talking about? He says what he's talking about. The one who hears my words and does them is like a wise man who builds his house upon a rock. The, the one who hears them but doesn't do them is like a foolish man who builds his house upon the sand. So in other words, Jesus is telling the parable so that they understand him immediately. It's not to conceal anything, but to understand it to the disciples. And then to his enemies, he tells parables often as well. I call them zingers. The parables he tells his enemies are to convict and reprove them. For example, the Good Samaritan. Jesus tells the Good Samaritan not to conceal the truth, but to explain a tru truth in a way that convicts the person who asked the question. The person that asked the question was, the question they asked was, who's my neighbor? And Jesus picks the most despised person in their society and makes a point, that's your neighbor if he's in need. And then gets the guy to admit to it. <laughs> or the parable of the prodigal son. The whole point of the parable of the prodigal son is to explain why Jesus is spending time with sinners and, and whatnot. And, and because there's so much rejoicing. And, and the, the zinger part of the parable is that don't be like the elder brother who is totally clueless about the, the, the importance of the younger brother coming home. And so Jesus told all different kinds of parables, but those are three different crowds he would tell them to, the crowds, the disciples, and his enemies. And he was accessible. Jesus didn't shut himself behind closed doors. He didn't limit access to the most capable disciples. He wouldn't say, all right, if you can tell me <clears throat> what Exodus... Chapter 20, verse 12 says, I'll let you listen to my teaching. He didn't do that. He was accessible. He, you know, he, he didn't just spend his time with the, the uh, elite or something like that. He was accessible. People were always coming up to Jesus. People were drawn to him. He was like a magnet, partially due to his healing ministry, right? I mean, if you healed somebody from some you know, crazy sickness, that would make friends, right? And people love to come up to Jesus. The rich would come up to Jesus. The poor would come up to Jesus. Sick people, lots of sick people and crazy people with demons would come up to Jesus. 
And angry people sometimes, or other teachers, or even foreigners would come up to Jesus. Parents would bring their children to Jesus to bless them. One time they did that, and the disciples shooed them away. The disciples rebuked them. Get these kids out of here. It's a rabbi. It's not a circus. Right? Or whatever. I don't know what they actually said. But, you know, they, they rebuked them. Right? And it's, it's one of the few places where Jesus gets angry. It says Jesus was indignant. He was indignant. And he said, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And he took them, the children, in his arms and blessed them. And Jesus taught how to pray. Naturally, a rabbi would teach the way, the best way to pray to God, right? And so Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. He says, don't be like the hypocrites. Jesus could not stand hypocrisy. I mean, he just, he just had no tolerance for it at all. If, if he... If he if he saw hypocrisy, that person was getting a woe. In their culture, that's a big deal, all right? That person was getting a woe. And Jesus would, would say to them, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who stand in the street and make these long prayers or love to be seen in the synagogue and make these glorious prayers. But you go in your inner room and you pray privately to your Father and He will see it and He will answer your prayers. He taught that... You don't have to repeat the prayers mindlessly, mindlessly, just over and over, just repeating, thinking if you say the same prayer enough times, eventually it'll kick into gear or something, right? He said, don't do that. But then another place he teaches, persist. Like a widow who's been wronged and she's dealing with a judge who doesn't care. Persist. Go every day, right? And so persist, but with your heart in it. And Jesus taught that we should trust the God, that God is a good father. And that he will give us what is good. And that if we don't forgive others, God's not going to forgive us. Right in the context of prayer. And then he gives what we call the Lord's Prayer, or sometimes known as the Our Father. Verse, uh, Matthew 6, 9. It says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's the kingdom again. Wouldn't you know it? Right in the middle of the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come. What is that? That's when your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And lastly, what I want to look at is the Shema. The Shema is a Hebrew word. It means hear. It means listen up. And the Shema is the core creed of ancient Judaism. Uh, Second Temple Judaism, that's the kind of Judaism at the time of Christ. Rabbinic Judaism, that's the Judaism that survived the temple destruction. Medieval Judaism and modern Judaism, all three branches. The Shema is the core creed. In other words, I'm saying to you, I don't care what kind of Jew somebody might be or when they might live, from the time of Moses on, this is the core statement of what they believe. And it goes like this. Well, let me, let me give you the setup here. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. Now, what's a scribe? A scribe is one of the people that has recognized their calling is to preserve the Scripture. And do we know if the scribes did a good job or a bad job? We know that they, they did a good job. They were meticulous. And... Let me tell you something. If you've copied the scriptures, let me try this sometime. Copy just a chapter, from, just in English, from one page to another. It goes in your head. You know what I mean? The scribes knew the Bible. And so a scribe would spend uh, their, their, their waking hours copying the scripture. And his question to Jesus is, he, well, he saw Jesus as a rabbi answered them well. So he's like, well, this, this is... A, you know, seemed like a legitimate teacher. Let me ask him my, my question. Which commandment is the most important of all? You know, they, some people have, have looked at all the commandments and they've, they've decided that there are 613 commandments, right? And so the scribe's like, well, which one, which one do you think is the most important, Jesus? And Jesus, does, it doesn't even look like he had to think about it. He just answered. Jesus answered. The most important is Shema, or hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And so that is the central statement of 
Judaism, then or now. And Jesus is not some radical setting out to start a new world religion. He's a Jew talking to a Jew about their book. And one says, what's the greatest commandment? He's like, well, what do you think? The, everybody knows this. The Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, Yahweh our God, is one Yahweh. He's one, and you shall love him with everything. That is for Jesus the core. He doesn't deviate from what that person is asking him on this question, that person's own mindset. And I'll, tell you, I'll show you how I know that. At verse 31, and then he says the second. He only asked him, what's the greatest? Jesus is like, all right, here's the greatest, and here's the second. Right? He's a good teacher. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So love God. There's one God, love him. And then love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 32, and the scribes said to him, you're right, teacher. You're right. They agree. You have truly said that he is one. And there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. So the scribe agrees with Jesus, and now Jesus is going to pay him a compliment. Jesus saw that he answered wisely. He said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. I wasn't lying when I told you the kingdom, understanding the kingdom is the key that unlocks understanding Jesus. You know, like he was just like talk about it all the time. And here he says to him, you know, you're not too far from that. You know, he's not saying I'm the Messiah. That's a little too, you know, he wants the guy to actually have faith here and make a decision. But it's like you're not far from the kingdom. And so that's, that's the Shema, the core creed of ancient Israel, of Israel to this day. Jesus knew his father was greater than he, John 14, 28. He knew he could do nothing on his own, John 5, 19. That his goal was to do the will of the father who sent him, John 5, 30. He believed in Yahweh, the creator of the universe, who rescued his people out of Egypt and gave them the promised land. He taught that God was one and that we should love that one God with everything. Next to that, we also love our neighbors as ourselves. That's how Jesus summarized the most important. And if I don't tell you that, then I, you know, I would have missed out <laughs> the central part of what Rabbi Jesus teaches us. Like I said, I don't have time to go through all of it, so read the Gospels, because in them you have all these teachings, and they explain how to live as a follower of Jesus. Now, I realize this time I've talked to you about Rabbi Jesus I did not talk to you about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. So we'll do that next time. If you enjoyed what you heard here, why not give Restitutio a five-star rating in iTunes or Stitcher? Doing so will help others find this podcast and inspire them to love God, follow Christ, and seek truth wherever it leads.